Thank you, everyone. I see everyone's coming into the room saying good morning. Um, good morning to you all as well. Thank you for being here. My name is Sierra Lau, and I am part of the California School Based Health Alliance. And I would just like to welcome you today to our webinar on healing centered approaches to addressing adolescent relationship abuse in school based health centers. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started today. This webinar is being recorded and these slides, uh, the recording and the slides will be emailed to you as well as posted on our website after today's presentation. Um, we do have a full hour of content today. So any questions that get dropped in the chat, we will be able to answer at the end, but it'll be after uh, 12 o'clock most likely. So just a heads up, if you put a question in the chat, we will get to it, but um, we have a lot of content we wanna cover. So it'll probably be after, um, after me. Next slide, please. Just a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance. If you are not familiar already, we are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. We do this through two main ways. Um, we advocate for more school-based health centers and we support uh, and help improve the existing ones. There's a lot of things that we do to, to help this. Uh, to help move this along. We have policy, capacity building, technical assistance, like today's webinar. Um, and that website is a link to our website where you can find more information about us. Next slide, please. We do have our conference upcoming, still in person as of now. Uh, the full day will be April 29th at the University of Redlands in San Bernardino. We really encourage you to join us and check it out. We have a lot of awesome workshops that are really hands-on um, because they're re really itching to be in person. So we really made the content interactive. So we hope you can join us. Next slide, please. If you aren't familiar already, we have a membership. Um, it gives you an awesome discount on conference registration. So definitely check it out if you are planning to register for our conference. We also have tailored technical assistance to your organizational needs. Um, and there is a link to sign up in case you're interested. And next slide, please. Without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Rebecca Levinson. Rebecca Levinson is the architect for Futures Without Violence, uh, the Q's intervention. She is also a former clinic director for Planned Parenthood, where she fell in love with adolescent health education and prevention. Blending these experiences, she recognizes the power of school-based health providers to support youth experiencing abuse. And Rebecca, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. And I'm really excited to be with you all today. I really do love um, adolescence, and I know that you all do too. So I, um, I'm just really excited to be with you today. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Futures Without Violence is, we are the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Resource Center on Health and Domestic Violence for the whole country. So our charge is to kind of bring the latest and greatest to the field. Um, and support you in your efforts um, helping. Um, and the other thing that we do is we, we do a lot of work with domestic violence agencies. And so my dear friend, Lee Hoffheimer, who's a part of the Washington State Coalition on Domestic Violence, um, shared some qualitative research with me that I thought you would enjoy. Um, and here's what young people had to say about issues around um, abuse. And I just need to, oops, sorry about that. I need to make my... See, now I'm having my problems with my screen. Here we go. Nope. Nope. Um, I'm gonna just fix this because if I don't, it's gonna make me, oh, there it is. Okay, there. Um, I was just trying to get rid of the big picture with everybody's face across my slides and um, now, they're, now it's off. So Here's what, here's what young people shared around um, their needs relative to uh, uh, what they want from, from you all. Um, one person needs to be um, comfortable with the conversation and if it would, it would be helpful if it were the adult, the adult. So they're saying what, what they really want is someone to be able to talk with them about healthy and safe relationships and ones that aren't be able to talk about adolescent relationship abuse. Their advice was also, it's okay to say, you don't know. It's okay to say that in front of us, actually, and and it it models, I think, what we really want adolescents to be able to do, which is ask questions and um, 
And then thirdly, I like to know about things even if I don't need it yet. So for the, my friends here on the phone who are working maybe with middle schoolers who perhaps aren't in a place where they're thinking about romantic relationships or in romantic relationships, they still want to know, um, they still want to understand about healthy and safe relationships. Um, what do we know about adolescent relationship abuse? It's one person or persons, because I know that some of our youth are in polyamorous relationships. So I want to re recognize that, but it's a pattern of behaviors to gain and maintain power and control over a dating partner. Typically, the cycle gets worse over time. It's not a one and done sort of thing. And, you know, worth noting, there's all kinds of ways power and control show up. And certainly one of the things we'll be talking about today is the way it shows up specifically um, relative to digital abuse. We know that one in five girls report experiencing physical or sexual violence in an intimate relationship. And that every year in the US, and this is why we're so happy you're on the call with us today, there are about 400,000 adolescents who experience serious physical or sexual violence in a dating relationship. And certainly, you know, the other thing that you're going to be hearing about as the eyes and ears of, of the school is um, sexual harassment as well as, as um, physical and sexual violence. So violence is gendered, <clears throat> but young people of all genders experience it and also perpetrate it. Girls are more likely to be victims of physical abuse. Boys are more likely to be victims of psychological abuse. And we know that mutual uh, aggression happens. And so it's important, what we're wanting to do is sort of paint a picture about, um, you know, thinking about context, impact, and outcomes matters. And we're gonna be talking about um, safer planning at the end of my talk today, so that you'll have some more tools to address some of the complexities that I know that you see um, on a regular basis for some of you. I also want to talk just for a second about gender, right? So historically, we've been thinking boys and girls. And obviously, I think the other piece that we all know is that trans and gender diverse folks sometimes get lumped in with lesbian, gay, bisexual folks. And, and I think that it's worth mentioning that the emerging work around all the gender identities is new-ish to the field. Um, in fact, I pulled this data for this talk. This is from 2020, this is Australian data um, because there's very little out there specific to trans and gender diverse youth. So this was a study looking at 14 to, 19, to 22 year olds, if I'm, if I'm right about that. And about a third of the participants or over 800 students involved in this research um, experienced abuse within an intimate relationship. So to give you a little more context there. I, I, this was something I know that you all were interested in, and I'm, I'm so glad you are because the power of technology to destroy people, um, cause incredible harm is real and huge. Um, we know one in four teens report being put down by their partner via phone or texting, um, and only 9% of students who are experiencing um, harassment, um, other kinds of things, only 9% seek help. And so part of what we're gonna be doing today is, is recognizing that youth have a hard time asking for supports. And so we need to figure out a strategy together. And that's what Hughes is about, our intervention, about making sure that nobody is left behind. Um, and I, I think the technology piece is really important because we know it's a red flag for other kinds of abuse. So 84% of those who experienced cyber abuse said that they were also psychologically abused by their partners. And 52% say that they were also physically abused and 33% say they were physically, um, sexually coerced. I'm just gonna play a little, um, this is about a minute long video, but I think it really sums up the experience of how power and control shows up in relationships. And, um, Sierra, if you just would give me the heads up that it, that you can hear it, that would be great. Because I love you. I want to be your only guy. Because I love you. Skip class with me. Let's stay in bed today. Because I love you. I just want to be with you so freaking much. Because I love you. I waited for you after Ken Lab. You were walking with Mark? Because I love you. You shouldn't be hanging out with that dude. You should know how dumb that makes me look. I don't care if she's your lab partner. Why do you have texts from him? Because I love you. This number? Delete. Because I love you. This Jason number? Delete. And, and Ben? Delete. 
because I love you, I should smash your phone. I'll let you give me your password instead because I love you. I will check your texts every day. You got lucky because I love you. Because I love you. You think it's okay. Because I love you. You understand. Because I love you. I'm going to bed with me in two years. I'm you don't completely alone. alone. That's not love. So I, I think that's a powerful video. Um, certainly you're going to have these slides at the end, but I think it's something to think about, um, you know, maybe running in, um, in your waiting room or thinking about other ways in which you can share this with partners on campus, other teachers who might be teaching um, health ed, et cetera. Oh, okay, we don't want that. So this is also from loveisrespect.org. Um, and you know, one thing that I've seen happen in schools that's kind of cool is you could do a big board where you ask about digital dating abuse, and then every day you could do uh, one of these bullet points. So in a healthy relationship, all communication is respectful, whether in person, online, or by phone. So um, you may be experiencing digital abuse if your partner tells you who you can be friends with on Facebook and other sites, et cetera. So you can just see that this is a another tool for you in thinking about how you share information. Um, same is true here. This is from the same website. So there's there's great um, resources out there for you from Futures, but also from loveisrespect.org. What do we know about how intimate partner violence uh, affects health and well-being? We know that everything from anxiety to asthma to unintended pregnancies is connected. For adolescents specifically, we know that girls who are in abusive relationships are about twice as likely to become pregnant as non-abused girls, and that adolescents are three, two to three times more likely to experience violence during and after pregnancy as compared to older women. And then we, we also see this, this issue of rapid repeat pregnancy. So we know that moms, young moms who are experiencing experiencing physical abuse three months after delivery, about twice as likely to have another pregnancy within 24 months compared with non-abused mothers. We also see power and control show up in all kinds of ways, including around either the ability to continue a pregnancy or terminate a pregnancy. And this is um, qualitative data from a, a, a woman that we interviewed. He really wanted the baby. He always said, if I find out you have an abortion, I'm gonna kill you. And so I was really forced into having my son. I didn't want to, I was 18. I was real scared. I didn't wanna have a baby. I just got into college on a full scholarship. I just found out I wanted to go to college and I didn't wanna have a baby, but I was really scared. I was scared of him. So while adolescent abuse is common, um, it's rarely identified in clinics serving adolescents. So we want, again, to sort of think about how we can change the game. Um, I think that, you know, the way your clinic feels um, matters a lot. Um, and really thinking about how you can protect privacy, confidentiality. I think um, displaying um, posters makes a difference. We have you can see here, there's a caring relationships and healthy youth. Um, there's a poster that goes along with that for um, trans and gender diverse youth. We have LGB, LGB tools as well, um, and certainly posters for your, your walls. So I'm gonna ask you quickly to, to ruminate on this first question. How many of you have, or know someone who has, ever left something out of a medical history or unintentionally or intentionally misreported information to their healthcare provider? The question I want you to answer in the chat is why might a teen do this? Why might a teen leave something out? What do you know from your experience? Fear, thank you. Scared, shame, embarrassment, judge, being threatened, embarrassment, yeah, and um, reporting, right? I mean, that's another that's another piece of it, right? That they're afraid of what's going to happen if they if they talk about what's going on. Talking about abuse may bring on more abuse. Nice. So 
So we have been really thinking about the limits of what we call disclosure-driven practice. So if you think about a standardized screening question about intimate partner violence, for example, has your partner ever hit, kicked, slapped, or choked you? And you get a no, that's the end of the conversation, isn't it? And I, I think the thing that we have recognized at Futures is that that automatically leaves behind a whole lot of folks. You saw earlier that only 9% of students who are experiencing that digital abuse told somebody about it, right? So part of our job is to make sure we don't leave anybody behind because we know that youth have good reasons to not always trust adults because they've had bad experiences or they're afraid of what's gonna happen if they disclose. So we have been thinking a lot about universal education and, and that equaling equity um, in healthcare, right? And, and I think when we do universal education, it provides an opportunity for youth to make a connection between violence, health problems, risk behaviors, and then solutions, right? Where can you go to get help that is confidential and anonymous? So our intervention, we call it CUES. It stands for Confidentiality, Universal Education and Empowerment, and the S is for Support. Um, some people in the world talk about, well, we have an app for that. At Futures, we say we have a card for that. These are the size of a business card. They're multifold panel, as you can see. And they, they start out with something positive, and then they move on to talk about other issues that may be going on. And it's really, they were created to support you in these conversations with young people, because I think sometimes, especially for maybe, maybe a newer nurse or someone who hasn't had as much um, experience talking about these issues, it can be a little hard to get started. So we wanted to support you with that, but we also really wanted to harness the power of youth in our intervention. Um, the Q's intervention is super, super simple, right? We're gonna see the patient alone first and disclose the limits of confidentiality. And I know sometimes your teenagers are, are kind of locked arm when they walk in to come see you. So really um, thinking about signage that says we have to see patients alone at some point in their visit. Um, we do this with everybody, normalizing that kind of thing can really make a difference. And, and, you know, it's as simple as this. You hand out two cards and you say, I've started giving two cards to all my patients. And by the way, this is my script. So you, you would change it up to make it real for, for the folks in front of you. So I've started giving two of these cards to all my students um, in case it's ever an issue for you because relationships can change. And also, so you have the info so you can help a friend or someone who's having a hard time. So you know how to help. And then you'd open up the card and do a quick review, right? It talks about healthy and safe relationships, ones that aren't and how they can affect your health and situations where young people are made to do things they don't want to. It gives you tips on ways you don't have to feel so alone. And on the back of the card, this is the S part, there are 24 seven texts and hotlines that have folks who really understand um, complicated relationships. You can also talk to me about any health issues or questions you have. And you can use hypotheticals, like my friend has this problem, question or concern, and that way we can avoid any reporting. I want you to think about the power of that, by the way. Imagine if you say and, 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 and reflect that you understand that for some people they can't share their stories and you create some space for that in your visit, how that can create more trust, more connection because you're meeting them in their truth. Um, and I think this piece around hypotheticals or for a friend is really important because it allows young people to ask questions and um, get answers without, without being reported. Um, what do you think happens when we, when we do this? I've started giving two of these cards to all the teens who come into clinic in case it's ever an issue for you because relationships can change, but also so you have the info on how to help a friend. And I'm gonna go ahead and just ask you, share out in the chat, what do you think happens when the card gets framed this way? What do you think happens when we frame invitation to share? They don't feel singled out. It gives them power to help others. Beautiful, yes. Um, more people ask for help, right? We've created space that this is not just something that's happening to you, which so often, you know, teens can or youth can think, gosh, nobody else is going through this except me. Um, more willing to open up, 
creates a sense of safety. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, next slide. So I wanted to just give you an example of one of the panels of the card, right? Are there times the person you're seeing shames you or makes you feel stupid, controls where you can go, reads your texts, make you feel afraid, threatens to put something on social media to control you, grabs your arm, yells at you, or pushes you. You're not alone. Nobody deserves to be treated this way for help and support. Text call lines are on the back of this card, right? So you can see here's another script for you. I'm gonna move this over. I share this with all my patients. Again, it could be students and it includes info on healthy and unhealthy relationships. <clears throat> and especially if you've never been in a relationship, it's hard to know what is and isn't okay. And isn't that, remember at the beginning of our talk today, I said, one thing youth told us is that they like to know things even before they are in the situation. And this is such a good example of the power of this tool. Um, for my, especially for my middle school uh, nurses on the phone. Like if a partner threatened to put something on social media to control you or tells you what, who can be your friend or what to wear, yells at you, or makes you do sexual things you don't want to. I know many students have friends in messed up situations like this. So I want you to know how to help. And the numbers on the back of this card connect you to people who get this complicated stuff. It's confidential and anonymous. Just think about the power of that for someone who's in it or the power of that for someone whose best friend is in it and they just don't know what to do. So I mentioned a little bit about the confidentiality piece, right? <laughs> I think scripts can help. We know students like to bring in their friends for support sometimes and we're glad um, and we'll come back and get you as soon as we've had a chance to you know, check in privately. So again, I just think it's helpful to post a sign if you don't have one already and students are used to being able to come back. Um, together to get health education or information from you. So cues um, does a lot of things. I think it, it builds relationships between the provider and the, the patient or client. I think it's strength-based and caring focused. It doesn't leave people behind. I think it improves access to advocacy because think about it, you know, right now the people who get info typically on where to get help for adolescent relationship abuse are people that are, have known problems versus everybody in the school having it, right? Now that we've given it to two of these cards out, you've, you've suddenly got boots on the ground all over the place that are helping make that message. I think it empowers clients and the, and the folks um, that they care about. And I think it shares power between the provider and client. And I, this piece around altruism has been really powerful in the research um, because of course, I know all of you went into this field to help right? It's the definition of um, school-based health is, you know, helpers. And, and I, I think it's so powerful to remember, especially for adolescents, the desire for them to make a difference in the world, right? So the power of social support is more about mutuality than about getting for self. That is, there's a need to give, to matter, to make a difference. We find meaning in contributing to the well-being of others. So teens like to be enlisted, you know how much they want to help their friends, and you're going to have great partners um, if you implement this. A little universal education goes a long way. I don't pretend that our cards cover everything for everyone, um, but I do like the idea that you um, take what we've learned from cues and you build on it in other ways. So what other topics are you covering um, organically? Um, so for example, we have all sorts of resources available at our program, like school supplies, information about community resources, emergency contraception, condoms, and pregnancy tests. Or because COVID has been so hard and affected so many young people's mental health, um, this next one might be especially relevant. So many of our students are struggling with school, lack of friends, just straight up loneliness in COVID. I just wanna make sure you know if it's ever an issue for you, you're not alone. We have counseling here if you or a friend were ever to need it. Suicide prevention, because I can tell you, I'm a mother of four. My oldest is 32, my youngest is 14. And at my daughter's school, which is Oakland School for the Arts in here in Oakland, um, I know from her mental health counselors 
that they had had like 15 suicide attempts within the first two months of school opening as opposed to maybe one um, prior to COVID. I don't know if that's true for others, but I think this issue of mental health and substance um, and suicide prevention is one that is probably on the hearts and minds of many of you. So I've also been talking about my talking with all my students about suicidal thoughts, which can be scary to have to have or hear if a friend shares theirs with you. This is important. Please know you can call the suicide hotline number if you or a friend are having those thoughts or you can talk to an adult. We made magnets for the lockers. It's one of the things that's happened. I know post COVID some schools are putting it on the back of like if a student has an ID that's on the back of their um, badge. So this is something you could talk to your principal or your superintendent about doing. Um, so I just think that there are a lot of strategies there. Also, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, adolescent relationship abuse is connected to all kinds of um, health outcomes and risks. Um, so here's another way that you can think about visit specific scripts. I always check in with my patients about, or you mentioned smoking and party, partying. When students share this, I always check in about relationships or hookups. Because if you're feeling afraid, uncomfortable, not in control, this can lead to more substance use. Like relationships can affect your health a lot in ways you might not guess. Cyber abuse. You said you have that you have had stuff go down with your boyfriend on social media. Can you share more with me about what this looks like? I'm asking because sometimes those things can affect how you feel in your health. And then for, for those of you who are doing reproductive health, right? We have a negative pregnancy test. And your, and your client says there's no desire on their end to be pregnant. Is anyone preventing you from using birth control or wanting you to get pregnant when you don't wanna be? These are all, I think, very powerful uh, nuggets to be thinking about sharing with folks in your work. And then when we think about safety planning, I want us to think bigger than just sort of physical injury or the domestic violence hotline, but really think about the ways in which you as providers can support safer planning, right? So for example, if you've got a teenager who says, yeah, I, I, I kind of think he'd like to have a baby with me, but I don't want that. You know, you might want to talk with them about getting a copper T IUD because the thing about a copper T IUD is that the strings can get cut off and you still get your period at the same time every month. And for folks in abusive relationships that have to do with reproductive coercion, a partner wanting to control um, pregnancy as a part of that, um, this can be a way for them to be safer because it's a method that doesn't mess up their menstrual cycles. And that's the thing that the abusive partner is monitoring is when you get your period. So that's something to think about. Emergency contraception. Um, you know, if you've got somebody experiencing reproductive coercion, I don't know I don't know if the packaging has changed or, or we've done something better <laughs> in school-based health, but when I was at Planned Parenthood, it kind of came in a big box and it said Plan B. <laughs> and so I'm um, talking to people about popping out those pills and putting them in a different place so that that's not identifiable. Um, you know, opening up a little, um, I don't know about your kids, but my daughter has like these little cute things that twist apart and it'd be really easy to put a set of pills in there and giving an extra dose for anybody who's experiencing um, reproductive coercion. And then SDI par partner treatment notification. So if you've got a, a student who has chlamydia or gonorrhea, et cetera, you know, it can be really dangerous to have to talk to your partner about that. So, you know, a confidential website as a way to inform people is, is definitely, um, again, a powerful tool for someone who's in an abusive relationship and worried about what their partner's going to do. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about monitoring phones and that being part of control. So it can be really powerful to offer up your phone for a student to use if they need to, to or want to talk to somebody about, you know, what's going on. We talked about a hypothetical earlier. So let's say the, the student says, well, actually, I have this friend who, yeah, her boyfriend, like, makes her do all this stuff, sexual stuff she doesn't want to, and she's afraid of him and afraid of what's going to happen if, if she breaks up. And you can say, would you like to talk to a DV advocate more about this? Like someone with a lot of expertise, you could just use my phone. And that would prevent the abusive partner, if she's the one that's actually being hurt in the relationship, from knowing that she had called the domestic violence hotline number. Um, 
So um, I mentioned that we've done a lot of research on cues. Uh, we did a, a randomized trial um, in, um, in eight school health centers in California. So thank you for any of you, if you were part of this, um, I'm, I'm so happy and thank you again for your willingness to support this process and project. The results of our study was that there was increased recognition about what constitutes sexual coercion as a result of using the cards. It increased awareness of relationship abuse resources, which is huge. Among youth with recent victimization, there was less relationship abuse at three months, also huge. Remember for our young, our youngins who are in first time relationships, I can't tell you the number of students who just thought it was normal, right? That this is what, like if I'm, if I'm being loved by someone or I'm in a relationship, that means this is the stuff I have to put up with. And, and especially if they've grown up in a home where similar patterns of behavior happened, they, they don't know any different, right? So the power of, of nurses or school-based health settings, you know, being that, that point of education, that point of connection around these issues is so important. And then there was an increased likelihood of disclosing any history of unhealthy relationships to the provider during the visit, because again, you've created space, brought up the topic and, and allowed for someone um, to focus on that with you. So while disclosure isn't the goal with universal education, disclosures happen, right? And I want you to be prepared for what, how to respond. What survivors tell us they want providers to do is to be non-judgmental, to listen, to offer information and support, which is why cues is so important, I think, and that they don't push for disclosure. I also want you to remember that some adolescent relationship abuse is about power and control and it's not reportable. So he tells me what to wear every day. She makes me feel stupid. They say no one else would ever date me. They threaten to put embarrassing stuff on social media if I don't do what they want. None of this is something that is reportable, but something that you would want to be able to respond to. So we think support is about showing gratitude. And I know this is probably second nature for many of you on this uh, webinar today, but taking that moment to say, I'm so grateful you shared that with me. Thank you for trusting me with your story. Imagine if that's the first words out of somebody's mouth when you've told them something that's making you anxious or worried or you've, a secret you've been keeping. I hear you saying that things are complicated. Would you like me to offer some thoughts on what other people have found helpful? I'm okay with just listening as well. This would be a great script for anything that comes up, um, but I think especially this piece about thanking them for sharing their story and trusting you is, is big. Okay, so we've had a positive disclosure of something. Um, I'm, so sh I'm so glad you shared that you were being hurt by your partner. I'm so glad you shared your story with me. You don't deserve to be treated that way. And I'm, I'm sorry this is happening. Is there anything I can do to help? I have seen, because I, I, I as a Sierra mentioned, I was a, a, a clinic director. I ran um, Vallejo, Vacaville, and Fairfield Planned Parenthood clinics a long time ago. And I can tell you that with adolescents, I, I, I had the experience of providers rushing to, oh my gosh, we're gonna need to report that. <laughs> And I just really want to underscore how important it is to not go there first. It is the last thing, right? This moment of disclosure is about thanking them for sharing their story, understanding what they need right now. Is there anything I can do to help? And then, and then let's take it back a notch. I mean, again, for, for those of you who've been working with adolescents for a long time, some of them have good relationships with their parents and some of them have crap relationships with their parents. And, and it's gonna make things worse when the parents are called about whatever issue is going on that needs to be reported, right? So is this something you were able to share with your parents? Sometimes it can be hard to do, I know. And if you'd like, I could sit with you while you share with them, or I could sit with you and call them and share what you shared with me and get the conversation started. Just think about what that would mean for some young person who's just overwhelmed by the idea that their parents are going to find out that they experienced a sexual assault or their parents were going to find out that there was something 
really coercive and abusive happening in their lives. So I think not going to, not jumping to reporting is really important. And then um, I want to share with you, oops, I'm sorry, I just jumped ahead. So this, I mentioned earlier that my um, friend Lee Hoffheimer from Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence is a is a great thinker about um, safer planning. And she and this woman named Jill Davies have, she's taken Jill Davies' work and she's really, I think, created, they've created a framework that's really powerful. And the idea is that the best we can do, the best we can hope for is safer planning, right? So safety means no violence, intact auton autonomy, social and emotional well-being. But safer might be the is the is is the incremental. It's 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 something to not lose sight of because it's helpful, right? So what we want safer means more autonomy, more supports, and that well-being is strengthened. It's not the perfect, but it's the better. And I, I think it's useful to reframe success, right? Safer gives us flexibility versus perfection, small steps, incremental change to make things better. And I think that the other thing that, that is so important is to listen to survivors because they are the experts of their own experience, right? Um, so start with the survivor's risk analysis. Um, look at their priorities and what things are they doing right now? Um, to, to take care of themselves. And we wanna look at strategies to reduce control. So this might be problem solving around, well, could you, you know, is it possible for you to use, ask to use your friend's phone if you need to, if you're worried that he's gonna be on your phone kind of thing. So we wanna start the conversation with what do you want help with now? What's your biggest worry? We want to understand what supports that they have. Have they been able to share this with anyone other than you? Um, I'm not an expert on this, but I know who to call to get support. So talking with someone be useful to you right now. I really, really want you all to consider calling your local domestic violence agency or calling the National Domestic Violence Hotline because they really are there to be helpful. And if you called and you said, hey, I'm school-based nurse or healthcare provider. And I, I want to know what would happen if they called the hotline. Like, what do you say to them? Like, how do you, how, what does it look like? You know? And I think for you to have a good sense of, of the expertise that's there and know that that expertise is for you also. Right. So they are there for you to problem solve. I have this student and I really want, I really want to understand how to best help them and they will help you. Safer planning and action, um, these are words from the field. Really listen, put everything else aside, listen to what she wants in the relationship. The client got to the point where she could talk about anything, which could be stressful for me, but it was really important for her. Identifying what helps calm things down, what makes the situation worse. Could their parents be more of a help or a hindrance? So again, some common aspects of safer planning. Um, conversation starter tips. So validation, thank you for sharing with me. Ask a student what's your biggest worry, how you can help. Ask about safer, pl safer planning strategies and ask about support systems. We talked about putting you on the phone with an advocate um, and, and the importance of uh, offering your phone as opposed to them making a call on their phone can be a really important step toward being safer. And I mentioned about um, domestic violence advocates are really there to support you um, and your work with adolescent, adolescents. Um, advocates assist survivors who've experienced adolescent relationship abuse or human trafficking to think and act in a way to increase personal safety while assessing risks. And, um, and especially for, and this is true for sexual assault programs as well, many of them have um, 10 free counseling sessions for young people. And I think that's a great uh, resource that maybe is underutilized for uh, middle school and high school students. Remember how we talked about situations where a young person is being harmed? This is one of those situations. I need to involve folks to help keep you safe. Would you be willing to make the call with me? What a beautiful way to make a space safer when you need to make a mandated report. What a 
what a what a human centered way, what a loving way to say, remember how we talked about situations where a young person is being harmed. This is one of those situations. And I need to involve folks who will help keep you safe. Language really matters. Um, you know, what if you just didn't use the word report? <laughs> remember when we talked about at the start of some of the things I can't, things, ah, remember when we talked at the start about some things that can't stay private, I need to share my concerns about your safety with other adults. We're required by law to help young people be safer and see how different that is from, I need to report what you told me and the, the power of that. So you really wanna include students in every step of the reporting process. And one thing I wanna say here, just because I've worked um, with school districts around Title IX, I, I really hope to see deeper partnerships between um, sort of the safety officers and the superintendent and the principal and the school nurses so that when a student has had something critical happen, we know there has to be a report that they are in a position to retell their story 16 times. One of the suggestions I'm making um, for school-based health settings and for schools generally is if you have a student who is, is about to tell you something you know is gonna be hard, you I, I would want to Zoom it and record it so that you can pass it up the food chain and explain that. I don't want you to have to retell your story. Would it be okay if we did this? Because I think that's just a really, think about the number of people that could be involved if it's a sexual assault, because it is gonna be the safety officer. It is gonna, it is gonna be the, you know, the, the administrator. It is gonna be potentially the police. It is, you know, so all of, all of the places where we can think about reducing additional trauma for the survivor, I think is really important. So again, you all don't need to be experts on adolescent relationship abuse. I, I, I just want you to know that there are resources for you. And I think that you all are in an incredible position to do prevention, education, and intervention. And I just couldn't be happier to be on the call with you today. I think some of you know about some of these lines. I, I For my friends who are working with gender diverse um, queer trans youth. I think it's great to know about the Trevor, um, the Trevor hotline that's there for LGBTQ youth. There's a trans lifeline for folks who are, who are um, feeling suicidal. Um, there's certainly the National Domestic Violence Hotline, National Runaway Safe Line. And if you are working with um, Native American students, um, then, then I think Strong Hearts can also be a really powerful tool. So we're going to go ahead and just define success. Um, it's we we see success around these issues as um, our ability to reduce isolation and improve outcomes through universal education and connection. Um, I, I hope you all got a sense of the power of the cues approach versus screening in and of itself. Um, the power of those supportive messages. Um, and to the ability to make warm supported referrals to DV programs. And then really thinking about, you know, your differential diagnosis when you're talking to young people. So if you've got someone coming in for a lot of pregnancy tests, I want to know if someone's trying to get them pregnant when they don't want to be. If you've got someone who has, you know, own cop to su substance use, a lot of it, et cetera, I want to know what's happening in their relationship, if that's connected to it. Um, and then same thing with sexually transmitted infections. I wanna know, is there something else going on there? And, and, and use that opportunity to, to check in about power and control in their relationships. So I love, I love these, this intervention. I love um, the, the stories that stay with me. This is one from a qualitative study um, we did in Pittsburgh. And here's what this young woman said to me. So there'll be times where I just read the card and remind myself not to go back. I'll use it so I don't step back. I'll pick up on the subtle stuff because they'll trigger me. I remember what it was like. I remember feeling like this. I remember going through this and I'm not gonna do it again. For me, it just helped me stay away from what I got out of. I carry it with me actually. I carry it in my wallet. It's with me every day. So I, 
I wasn't sure if we were going to end up having time for questions, but I see that we are we, we do have time. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my share so I can see faces and see if anybody has any questions or if um, Sierra, if there was stuff that came up in the chat, this is please ask away. Yes, so there was one question that came up. You kind of touched on this, but maybe if you have more to add, the question was, when a CPS report is required as a mandated reporter, how would you have that conversation with the youth without losing trust? If there's yeah. anything else you want to add, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, that's such a good question. And I love that that's your, that's your question because it says that you're, it's really on your mind. How do we, how do we do no further harm, right? And I think that including them, respecting them, right? I'm going to have to do this, but I will sit with you or I will, I'm happy to call, you know, the, the offering of talking to parents, I think it's huge as a first step, um, even before you get to that conversation about reporting. So I think we went over the strategies. I think it probably got answered in the talk, but I, I just love that that was a question that was asked. Anybody else? Yeah, folks. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, yeah, we, we ended a little bit early and so now we have time for questions. I know that originally I said it might go over. And so if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, we would love to answer them. Go ahead, Rebecca. You know, I realized I, I, I stopped my screen share and I didn't show your slides. So I, now I have to say I'm, I'm sorry. And, um, <laughs> that's okay. All it is is our contact information so that if they have additional questions, they can reach out to you um, or me if they would like. Um, but we're also going to be sending a copy, yes, a copy of the presentation as well as the recording in an email after, um, after the webinar, probably the end of this week, beginning of next. So you'll be getting that in your inbox uh, and you'll have our emails in there. And I guess this is an opportunity. If any of you have had situations come up or are struggling or have had, you know, a moment in the work that, you know, you, you, it's staying with you for whatever reason. I, I, this is an opportunity to, to share some of that and, you know, get support for each other uh, around things. We, we opened up a conversation like this um, to a national webinar we did with school-based health settings and someone talked about how hard it was that they had a a student come in and share their experience around trafficking. And that's, that student was already involved, system involved, et cetera, et cetera. And they had a really great conversation. And the, and the nurse said, but you know, they never came back in. And I, I don't, I haven't been able to wrap my head around it because I really thought we connected. And I, and you know, what we ended up having a conversation about was the power of seed planting and I, so I don't know if there are other things on your mind like that, but I, I think it was really powerful for that nurse to really have a chance to hear from colleagues that, that, you know, the fact that that student opened up meant that they trusted them. And that was a huge compliment in and of itself. And um, yeah, so, so if there are other things or other questions, I certainly wanted to create space for it. We did have another question and come in. Um, how can we approach this with teens who are on the other end of exerting power and control? That is a really good question. Um, and I think schools are struggling with it all the time. You know, what do you do? Because you don't want to throw away students. We know that they're, we know that their 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 brains can change and adapt and they can learn. And I think sometimes it's helpful to think about ways to build empathy, you know, how, how their behavior may make someone else feel. I think that's the restorative justice process in situations that involve physical or sexual harm um, can be incredibly powerful for the student who caused the harm. And there's a bunch of resources um, around that. And it's certainly in a perfect world, that would be what we would suggest for all school districts is that they have a strong restorative justice process. And then, you know, opportunities for folks who've engaged in harm. So for example, I'm sure you've all had an Instagram account that blew up and, and not to be totally gendered about it, but in my experience, it, it's a lot of guys, maybe they're part of a team, water polo team, football team, whatever. And maybe they have an Instagram or some kind of thing like that that has 
pictures that they, it shouldn't be there, right? Or or captions underneath pictures that are really awful. And so then what do you do in that situation? And I think really helping them think about and, and hearing from when it's safe to do this, I think hearing from survivors when you when you create sort of really good restorative circles when they're at that place where the but where the folks who caused the harm have a chance to really reflect on that. And then the folks that have experienced the harm, we understand from them what they need and want. But often what we hear from survivors of sexual violence, especially is they don't, they want them to know what they did was wrong and they want them never to do it again to somebody else. Typically students aren't looking to have another student expelled or suspended, but rather they wanna take this harm that happened to them and, and turn it around so that the person who did it knows exactly how much it hurts. So sometimes it involves letter writing. So the students that were harmed will write letters to the people who've engaged in the harm so that they can really hear from their perspective. Like it kept me up, it keeps me up every night when I smell or see this thing, I, I remember what you did to me or whatever, right? And that these are some of the strategies that have been, I think most successful. And that's really engaging people in empathy work and restorative processes. Um, we had someone comment that they'd like to know more about the Hangout and Hookup Safety Cards. So I don't know if you can maybe talk a little bit about them. Yeah, so I'll just go ahead and put our, I'm going to um, move my slides again. Here, I'll escape and then I'll go back to the front because I can show you where to order them. Um, let's see here, go back all the way to the front. And remember I said some people say I have an app for that. At Futures, we say we have a card for that. Here, we'll go to this one. From current slide. So you can go to ipvhealthpartners.org um, to get more setting specific um, supports, safety cards. There's other training curricula, clinical guidelines, um, electronic health, uh, and other documentation tools. And so I'll just leave this up so you know where to go. Any other thoughts or questions? You're welcome to come off mute if, if you're a talker rather than a typer <laughs> um, and ask a question or, or certainly um, share in the chat. Yeah, I think if folks, um, you can raise your hand and then I can unmute you. So if, if you would like to um, go ahead and, and ask a question that way, feel free. Just while there's a pause here, um, I'm gonna let you all know as you exit the webinar, uh, evaluation will automatically pop up. It's just a five multiple choice questions. If you could please answer them, they really help us um, when planning our webinars. Um, so we did just a, maybe a few more minutes, two more minutes for see if there's any other questions that come in. Um, and thank you all yeah. for joining us. And did you say you were going to, um put the eval in the chat or I'm pulling up your last slide again now, just in case there's something on there. No, no, there isn't. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, the, actually, when they when they exit out of Zoom, it'll automatically pop up. So they okay. don't have to do anything, <laughs> put a tip, click on any links, it's automatic. Um, so That's yes. awesome. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Yes, I really, really appreciate all you do. I think my big takeaway, my wish, um, in addition that everybody gets cards and does cues with, with, the, with the students that they serve, I do think this issue of students needing to repeat their stories is something I am hoping school-based health settings can um, take on as a charge because I, you know, I, I, I work with survivors of sexual violence as a sort of a, volunteer in my own school district and the number of students who've, who've told me, I, I literally told seven adults in one day what happened to me. I just, we, we can do better than that, you know, and I, and I, and I really, I really want, you know, that to me requires a conversation between the superintendent and the powers that be and school-based health, but I do believe you have the hearts and minds um, and sort of experience and understanding of, of traumas such that you could be a powerful voice for that kind of change in your school district. So I would, I would wish that for all students and, and um, 
yeah. So I guess I'll just say thank you so much for what you do every day. And thank you for caring about the issue. And thank you for taking the time. And Rebecca, thank you so much for presenting. I learned so many things. So I really appreciate you taking the time and coming to speak with all of us. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank Bye. You.